Hello, uh, good afternoon. Uh, welcome to the webinar where we are going to uh, discuss the uh, ideal management for maillets and how the selection of that management should be done. My name is Francisco Cruz. Uh, I live in Porto. And uh, together with Atanasio Zakario from Ioannina, Greece, we are going to moderate uh, this uh, session uh, in which we, we also have uh, the collaboration of Enrico Finanziagro from Rome and Luca Zapala from Warsaw, from Poland. Uh, this is a, a, a joint uh, uh, collaboration uh, between two sections, the female and functional urology and the outpatient and the office urology sections. And of course, uh, under the umbrella of the European School of Urology. Uh, there is an accreditation. Uh, uh, you might receive, for those that are attending, you might receive one European CME credit if you complete the questionnaires after attending the webinar. And here you have our affiliations as well as uh, our disclosures. And now I hand over uh, the uh, meeting to Athanasius Zakariou in Greece to present uh, the flow of uh, this webinar. Athanasius, please. Uh, good afternoon. It is an honor for me uh, to participate in this uh, webinar. Thank you for your kind invitation. Uh, in this uh, webinar, we are going to present uh, uh, if uh, in uh, 2022 clinical evaluation still useful for male LUTS management, uh, presented by Professor Francisco Cruz. What is the role of Eurodynamics for the decision of male LUTS management by Professor Enrico Financia Gro? Uh, how frequently is the management of persistent LUTS required by patients after surgical intervention for BPH or BPE uh, by Athanasio Zakariou? And finally, uh, we are going to present the clinical cases by Lucas Zapala. Uh, and, uh, uh, I would like to invite Professor Francisco Cruz for his presentation. Thank you, Athanasius. So uh, uh, this is uh, the first slide of my presentation. And uh, the question is, if in 2022 clinical evaluation is still useful for male labs management. And uh, 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 what uh, I intend as uh, clinical evaluation uh, is, of course, to investigate the uh, uh, type of lower urinary tract symptoms, their severity, the bothersome they cause to patients. And if you, we use the epilates data, we can conclude that uh, we have patients that have voiding symptoms or storage symptoms, but alone, this is a minority. The majority of the patients will have a combination of uh, uh, voiding, storage, and post-micturition symptoms. And that means that during clinical evaluation, we will need to understand which are the symptoms that are most severe and most bothersome to patients. As clinical evaluation, I also intend uh, to uh, say, uh, 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 the frequency volume chart. And this is important if the patients have uh, nocturia. Uh, the only way to detect uh, nocturnal polyuria and polyuria is using a frequency volume chart. And this is an important step in the clinical evaluation of male LUTs. During clinical evaluation, one important aspect uh, is to investigate if the patients have uh, metabolic syndrome. Because in this uh, study that has already a few years, uh, there is an association between the waist circumference and the prostate volume. The higher the waist circumference, the larger uh, is the size of the prostate. And the uh, uh, higher is the score of the IPSS. 
So it might be important to investigate uh, this point also. And uh, we know from the uh, survey of the aging male published uh, almost 20 years ago, that there is an association between low urinary tract symptoms and, uh, uh, and uh, uh, sexual dysfunction. So patients with more severe low urinary tract symptoms, whatever the age, will have lower uh, sexual uh, or less sexual activity. And in addition, we know that some medication, medication might affect, uh, in fact, uh, the sexual activity. Then we have physical examination as part of the clinical evaluation. The digital rectal examination is extremely important to investigate prostate and uh, estimate the size. And uh, we know now that uh, ultrasound machines are basically a part of the physical examination that might be very helpful to estimate the prostate volume into, and to investigate the post void residual. Not to measure the truce of wall sickness and uh, in fact, to measure intravesical prostatic protrusion, uh, it is not recommended by guidelines, but we can discuss that later on. So with this information, we can use this information for first to inform the patient about the risk of uh, 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 of uh, symptom progress of BPH progress. Because from the uh, OMSIV County study, we know that uh, patients that are older have a higher risk of progression. Uh, patients that have larger prostate volumes that have more uh, uh, severe LUDs will have higher uh, ra uh, 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 risk of BPH progression and uh, LUDs progression. And uh, of course, if we have a oral flow meter, if the patients have a low flow, the risk of progression is higher. And that was confirmed also by the placebo arm of the MTOP study. And uh, uh, we know now that, uh, and that is marked by the red circle, that patients that have a higher uh, post void residual have a higher risk of progression. Of course, MTOP study also confirmed the prostate volume, the flow, and the PSA, which is a surrogate marker of the prostate volume as uh, risk factors for progression. Then uh, the data we obtained from clinical uh, investigation or evaluation is extremely important to define what type of treatment we want. Uh, and uh, if the patients have mild to moderate symptoms, uh, what is indicated to start is watchful waiting. This is quite evident from this study from Bob Javan. From almost 400 uh, males with at baseline an IPSS below eight. And after four years, we can see that only 31% of the patients had a progress uh, migrated into a more severe level of symptoms, and the majority of them into an intermediate level, which is very easily manageable uh, uh, by, by uh, the, the medication. Of course, investigation is also important to establish what will be the ideal treatment uh, to decide if we are going to use alpha blockers, 5-RIs, and hemoscarinics, beta-3 agonists, PD-5 uh, inhibitors, desmopressin alone, or in different combinations. Uh, alpha blockers are the, uh, those are the drugs that are most uh, commonly used throughout the world. They are very effective for treating storage and voiding symptoms. They can be used whatever the age of the patient, whatever the prostate volume, and the risk of adverse events are very few, particularly with the modern uh, alpha blockers that have very few uh, uh, risks of dizziness, orthostatic hypotension, although they might cause, particularly psilodosin, which is very alpha 1A specific, can cause dry ejaculation, and that is something that we should inform our patients. 
about the prostate volume and alpha blockers, uh, eventually in the long run, uh, the larger prostates might show a, a, a lower uh, a, a response to the alpha blockers as it was shown for terazosine in the Peter Boyle's uh, uh, meta-analysis, which is shown on the left side, larger prostates, less improvement in symptom score, or in the right side, you can see the data from uh, the combat study. At three months, the larger prostates in blue and smaller prostates in red had the similar outcome in terms of response to tamsulosine, but Two years later, you can see that the uh, smaller prostates had a better response than the larger prostates. Also, it is important, again, the metabolic syndrome. We know now that patients that have metabolic syndrome have uh, a poor response for, uh, uh, to alpha blockers, and that is something that we should inform our patients about. If the patients have persistent storage symptoms after the introduction of the uh, alpha blocker, we should probably introduce antimuscarinic drugs. Uh, that is something that we need to discuss with patients because of the initial symptoms that the antimuscarinics may cause, like dry mouth, and also to discuss the risk of retention, which is very low if the patients have residual volumes below 150. Or now we can use uh, the beta-3 agonists that reduce the frequency. And although the rating in the guidelines is still weak, is because we only have one study to investig that investigated this uh, add-on therapy of Mirabegron, the PLUS study. The clinical evaluation is also important for the introduction of 5RIs, because we know that 5RIs, finasteride on the left side, uh, the test right on the right side are uh, more effective in larger prostates. And we should not use uh, these agents if the prostate volume is below 40 ml and if the patients are not willing to uh, 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 receive this treatment for a uh, long term. Well, in the, uh, uh, about the use of PD-5 uh, inhibitors, particularly Tadalafil 5 milligram, which is the one that is indicated, we know that they can improve storage and voiding symptoms. They don't improve Qmax, but if the patients have sexual uh, impairment, if the patients have erectile dysfunction, it is a good drug to start because, uh, as you can see on the right side in the blue square, there is a good improvement uh, in the score of the International Index of Erectile Function. If the patients have nocturia and if uh, the, with the frequency volume chart we detect nocturnal polyuria, we can use desmopressin, although we have to be careful about the risk uh, of uh, uh, hyponatremia and it is important to measure serum sodium uh, uh, between the, the day three and day seven. And uh, it might be uh, tricky to use uh, desmopressin in patients above 65 years of age. So uh, in conclusion, I would say that clinical evaluation is still a key step in the assessment of male LUTs and BPH patients. The clinical evaluation helps physicians to inform patients about the risk of symptom progression Clinical investigation will help urologists to select ideal treatment, watchful waiting of pharmacological treatment. And so uh, nowadays, clinical investigation remains a key step in the study of male legs. So th uh, thank you for your attention. And at analysis, I hand over uh, the uh, session to you. Thank, thank you very much, Professor Q, uh, Cruz, for your presentation. Uh, let's invite Professor uh, Enrico Financiagro for his presentation. Uh, what is the role of Eurodynamics for the decision of male LUTs management? Uh, Professor Enrico Financi, please. Thank you very much, Athanasius. Uh, uh, first of all, let me say that it's a pleasure to share this time together. Uh, we are 
far, but still we are able to discuss together. Looking forward to meet all of us in Amsterdam for the meeting in July. Um, the, my, my presentation is about the role of aerodynamics in uh, LUTs, uh, main LUTs management. And if I can go on, okay. This is the definition of, uh, one of the definition of aerodynamics, the measurement of physiological parameters relevant to the function of the lower urinary tract. Uh, so if we uh, talk about aerodynamics, we may talk of non-invasive aerodynamics. Uh, already Professor Cruz uh, has uh, explained us uh, the role of some of these, uh, uh, of the informations coming from these uh, uh, non-invasive tests like the weather diaries, the urophlometry, the control of the uh, post-void residual urine. And all these, uh, instruments are recommended uh, by the by the guidelines of the EAU. Uh, but uh, here we would like to discuss a little bit more in depth the role of invasive aerodynamics. Uh, these tests are not recommended in the first line, uh, first assessment of the, our patients, uh, and may be recommended uh, in, uh, in, uh, in a second and specialistic uh, part of evaluation, especially before, uh, before surgery. Um, but uh, uh, we know that uh, uh, LATS may be uh, caused by a, a list of, of, uh, of uh, pathophysiological conditions. And we know that one of these, of course, is benign prostatic obstruction. But when we go, when we give the indication uh, for a surgery for BPO, what is, the, what is the indication? Of course, it's the presence of BPO. We should have an obstruction in our patient. And how can we uh, suspect the presence of BPO? We can use uh, other uh, non-invasive tests uh, that also Francisco has shown uh, in, in part. Uh, we could use the, uh, the, the um, uh, protrusion, the prosthetic protrusion in, uh, in, the, in the bladder. We can use uh, the, the, um, the ultrasound image uh, for the uh, for the angle of the prostatic to, to assess the angle of the prostatic urethra, we can measure the bladder wall thickness or 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 the weight of the bladder wall. We can check, of course, the um, post void residual. We can use the urophlometry, or we can use uh, the real non-invasive uh, pressure flow studies like the CAF uh, method. Here in this in this slide, but uh, if we look to the recommendation of the guidelines uh, of the EAU, uh, they, the, the, the guidelines state that we should not offer these non-invasive tests as an alternative to pressure flow study. So pressure flow study is the gold standard to assess the um, the presence of uh, obstruction. So. My first remark here is that we can use whatever clinical diagnostic parameter to investigate BPO, but we should remember that uh, the only recognized uh, way to assess the presence of BPO is the invasive urinary test, the pressure flow study in particular. Uh, going back to urophlometry, urophlometry can detect uh, with uh, reasonable uh, specific specificity uh, the presence of, B of, of obstruction. If you use a cutoff of 10 milliliters per second for the flow max, uh, there is a specificity, a specificity of 70%, a positive predictive value of 70%, but still uh, urophlometry is not able alone uh, to exclude uh, the drusor under activity or uh, um, to understand how a bladder voids if uh, uh, the patient is not able to uh, void more than uh, 150 milliliters. So you see this list of recommendations in the guidelines uh, perform pressure flow studies uh, when the further evaluation of the underlying pathophysiology of LATS is warranted, specifically perform uh, this test when a patient is not able to void uh, more than 150 milliliters or when the flow, when the flow rate is uh, higher than 10 milliliters per second. And, and again, perform pressure flow studies when the post-void residual is over 300 milliliters or when the patients are very young, below 50 percent, uh, so sorry, below 50 years or uh, very old, uh, above uh, eight years. So there are a list of recommendations for the use of aerodynamics. So we can, we should not say that uh, the, the guidelines, the EU guidelines do not recommend invasive aerodynamics, but they uh, do not recommend invasive aerodynamics routinely before surgery, but 
there is a list of circumstances uh, where uh, still these tests are recommended by our guidelines. And if we want to go a little bit more, a little bit more in depth in, the, in these uh, uh, recommendations, I think that there, there is a cornerstone in the research that is the so-called uh, upstream trial that was presented, uh, uh, I guess, three years ago, actually, in, at the EU in Barcelona by Marcus Drake and co-workers. And in this uh, study, they were able to see that uh, using or not using urodynamics before surgery did not change uh, the results of, of, of surgery in terms of uh, uh, improvement of the IPSS total score. Neither uh, urodynamics was able to reduce the number uh, or increase the number of patients undergoing surgery. So, uh, um, so this was the, 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 the main, uh, the main uh, uh, message coming from uh, from this study, but there was also another important message uh, that was uh, that sometimes urodynamics is not performed well, even in very experienced centers. This is an, an example you can see here on the right side, uh, a, a mistake, a, a Qmax that is a mistake, actually it's an artifact. The real Qmax is here, but still in this study, the Qmax uh, was uh, uh, considered the one on the right side. So uh, my third remark is that invasive urodynamics should not be routinely used before, uh, uh, before surgery, but uh, when used, uh, the, uh, the quality should be assured. So we should do good urodynamics when we use this, this test. So what is the role of urodynamics? Uh, um, uh, we know from this uh, um, Korean study that the uh, uh, truth under activity is certainly a factor that can reduce the, the, the outcomes, that can worsen the outcomes of surgery uh, in, in our patients. So you see here that the IPSS and QMAX were both uh, uh, significantly lower in patients with the true student activity. And if we look to this uh, sub-analysis of this, up, of the, uh, again, of this uh, upstream trial, uh, we can, uh, also find some more uh, important findings. Uh, for instance, uh, uh, from these uh, studies, from this study, we have, uh, let's say, the picture of the ideal patient to, uh, to operate, to uh, treat with the TRP. That is a patient we, uh, that is uh, moderately or uh, severely uh, um, uh, disturbed by by symptoms with a, an important uh, uh, score, the IPSS or IC, ICIQ score, that is disturbed for his quality of life with the QL over four, that is not too old, uh, better if uh, below 74 year old. And, and this is for probably the, the most important part with the pure uh, voiding dysfunction. So with an ICIQ voiding subscale score over eight, so with a lot of uh, voiding symptoms uh, and with the low uh, Qmax. So if we have uh, patients like that, uh, we can predict uh, a good outcome in, uh, in our surgery. But of course, we don't see only this kind of patients. If we look to this, um, uh, to this picture, that may be a little bit complicated, but I, I will try to explain it. Uh, here on the, on the left part, uh, we see patients with the Qmax below 10. You see that uh, in the, in the, green, uh, the um, orange line uh, is the line of patients operated. The blue line is, uh, are the patients not operated. Uh, both uh, patients operated or not operated. If the bladder obstruction, uh, bladder out of obstruction index uh, uh, is higher or lower, the impact on the final outcome is not that, that, that important. You see that the lines are usually not so uh, so uh, going, I mean, from, from, uh, from uh, one point to another, uh, stable with the increasing uh, uh, values of, uh, of bladder outlet obstruction index, and the same with the, for the bladder contractility index. So we, for patients uh, with a flow uh, below 10, uh, to add the information of, uh, uh, these, uh, um, of these parameters that comes only from uh, uh, from the invasive test uh, is not so important, but uh, the situation change uh, for patients with the flow between 10 and 15, and especially for
for patients uh, with the Qmax uh, above 15, you see here, the more uh, is uh, um, the more is the, the higher is the the BOOI. Uh, so the more the patients are obstructed, the better is the outcome of the surgery, and uh, the 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 uh, um, higher is the BCI. That means uh, the lower uh, it, it, there is a uh, reduction under activity, the better is the contractivity. Again, we have better results after surgery. So in patients with the Qmax above 10 milliliters per second, we may have uh, important information to understand the real possibility to have success uh, with, with, uh, with the surgery. And uh, this situation may be uh, partly changed by the presence of detrusor overactivity. Here you see on the, right, on the left side, if there is detrusor overactivity, almost no change with the changing BOI and BCI. But when there is no detrusor overactivity, the, uh, the higher is the B, uh, the bladder out of obstruction index, the better is the outcome. And the same for the BCI, the, the higher is the BCI, so the lower the presence of the tools and activity, the better is the outcome. So um, to summarize the data coming from the studies, we can profile our patients with the, uh, with the clinical data, but in some patients, and particularly in patients with the, with the uh, flow rate above 10 milliliters per second, uh, urodynamics may have a role in establishing when uh, be obstruction is present and when really surgery may improve symptoms. The ideal candidates, those with only voiding symptoms and a low uh, Qmax are, I mean, of course, are a part of the, our uh, populations, but not all the population. So in many cases, we may um, benefit from the use of urodynamics. And uh, finally, uh, this was a old study coming from, from Japan. Uh, the, the, and, and in these studies, uh, the, the, the conclusions of, of the, the authors was that uh, su success after QRP is related to the presence of BPO. So the more the patient is obstructed, the more we can have success in disobstructing the patient. That is something logical. Uh, the, the success is related to the absence of the user and the activity. And it's reduced the success by the presence of the over overactivity. I think that these conclusions are still valid also observing the, the, the more recent uh, uh, data. And to conclude uh, with my fourth and final remark, uh, so the goal of urodynamics is to explore the function uh, of uh, lower urinary tract to, uh, to try to identify uh, the pathophysiology below the symptoms and to, to try to identify risk factors for adverse outcomes, but also and probably particularly to provide the information for a shared decision making. And uh, I think that used in this way, uh, the, the, I mean, uh, the success, the, the importance of aerodynamics uh, is much higher. And with this, uh, I would like to thank you and greetings from Rome. Thank you, Enrico, for your summary and uh, for the indications for presenting clear indications for raw dynamics, invasive raw dynamics. And now I would like to uh, ask uh, Athanasius Zakario uh, to uh, discuss the uh, one, one difficult topic, which is the persistence of lower nitrate symptoms after prostatic surgery. So Athanasius, you have a difficult task. I'm sure that uh, you are going to give us the clear answers. Please. Uh, thank you for your kind invitation. Uh, uh, I'm going to present how frequently is the management of persistent LUTs required by patients after a surgical intervention for BPH or BPE. Uh, unfortunately, uh, 20 to 50% of patients experience persistent LUTs following TURP, with uh, multiple studies showing that improvement in storage symptoms was lower and less than the improvement in the voiding symptoms. This presentation is a concise review on the prevalence, pathophysiology, and predictors of LUTs following TURP. Freedom from medication is a common expectation for patients undergoing surgical treatment uh, for BPH. The use of medical therapy following uh, various uh, transurethral uh, prostatectomies is considerable and uh, is uh, 
variable across uh, medication types and uh, follow-up. Rate of medication discontinuation following TURP or, uh, uh, or, or uh, laser uh, prostatectomy uh, are generally comparable. Uh, with uh, TURP in this uh, review demonstrating slightly improved outcomes for other minimal invasive uh, techniques, for example, HOLEP, uh, data is minimal. In this uh, population-based uh, retrospective uh, study, including more than uh, 58,000 uh, men, it is clear that uh, medical management of these symptoms is not well studied despite uh, the lack of uh, evidence to support their use. Uh, this study demonstrates that after a median follow-up of uh, two years, A blockers, uh, five varies, and uh, anticholinergics or uh, beta-3 agonists are uh, prescribed from 11 to 17% of patients. Primary care physicians uh, are usually prescribed alpha blockers. On the other hand, Urologists usually prescribe, prescribe five eyes. Maybe they are afraid of uh, a return procedure or to avoid the risk of bleeding, uh, or maybe they are afraid of incomplete uh, resection. Anyway, there are a lot of people taking a medicine after uh, the surgical procedure. Nocturia is traditionally classified as a storage, a lower urinary tract symptom. And, uh, uh, we can find up to 40% of our patients still have nocturia more than one year after the surgery. And uh, uh, why do we have uh, nocturia? Um, nocturia may be caused by small functional bladder capacity, that means overactive bladder, uh, impaired emptying and uh, the presence of a large uh, post voice residual urine, that means the under underactivity or maybe overproduction of uh, urine during uh, the night, and that means nocturnal polyuria. All combinations of the above are expected. And uh, we believe that uh, long-term urinary obstruction has been uh, implicated in the pathogenesis of uh, nocturia uh, because it might use elevated uh, upper urinary tract pressure, and uh, that uh, uh, means uh, affection of a renal function resulting in nocturnal polyuria, or maybe changes the circadian renal handling of sodium, and that means uh, overexpression, overexpression of uh, sodium during a night time. But uh, we should not forget that uh, our patients are old patients and present comorbidities. That means that uh, even the release of uh, bladder outlet obstruction is not enough to relieve our patients from nocturia because uh, they are suffering from cardiovascular diseases, sleep uh, uh, issues, uh, nephrological uh, problems, and uh, so on. Storage uh, problems are uh, connected with overactive bladder symptoms. And uh, these symptoms may persist up to 30 to 50% of patients. According to KG Yama, uh, we have three patterns of uh, uh, Bladder, uh, uh, bladder function uh, according to urodynamic uh, evaluation after TURP procedure. Pattern one, uh, the characteristic uh, phasic detrusion overactivity. Pattern two, uh, a single episode of uh, detrusion overactivity at the bladder volume less than 160 ml. And pattern three, a single detrusion overactivity episode at the bladder volume more than 160 ml. Patients with pattern three have spontaneous resolution, and patients in, with pattern one present a persistent uh, detrusor of their activity postoperatively. Uh, and standing this uh, population, we realize that patients in uh, pattern one are usually older patients and, were, and are more likely to report storage symptoms that means use urgency in the preoperative period. Of course, we do, should not forget uh, the novel storage symptoms. That means uh, uh, sphincter deficiency. That's a very, uh, it's a rare complication. 
uh, we have uh, reports about stress incontinence uh, in a special uh, procedure, just like a open prostatectomy. And uh, avoiding problems after uh, Lutz uh, procedure, after a BPH uh, procedure, surgical procedure, uh, usually uh, we have uh, the trusher and contractility uh, as an underlying condition in 11 to 40% of men with uh, LATS. And it is often believed that uh, these symptoms are due to prostate enlargement that cause bladder outlet obstruction and the relief of obstruction will resolve voiding and post-voiding symptoms. Surgical relief of a bladder outlet obstruction does not improve contractility. The presence of HDAXI and the weak stream have been reported as 42 and 33 percent respectively uh, post-surgically and according to your dynamic evaluation uh, we find a persistent uh, obstruction in 38% uh, and impaired contractility or acontractility in 25%. Sometimes symptoms do not correlate with the expected urodynamic findings uh, in the majority of uh, cases. Of course, in these cases, uh, urodynamics is recommended, uh, especially in patients with uh, uh, with unsuccessful invasive treatment for uh, LATS. And uh, we uh, follow uh, the uh, guidelines, uh, according, uh, we follow uh, the guidelines uh, just uh, like uh, uh, Enrico, Professor Enrico Acro presented uh, just before. Of course, we have uh, the classical obstruction after surgery. Uh, for example, we can uh, I mentioned urethral strictures uh, due to white caliber rosectoscopes, bladder neck contracture after uh, TURPF in uh, prostates uh, uh, less than 30 uh, ml, and of course, open prostatectomy with uh, bladder neck and urethral uh, stricture. Uh, we should mention that uh, there is a TURP reoperation rate 1 to 2% per year. And what are the predisposition factors? According to this papers, uh, many people, many patients, 20 to 50 percent, have persistent voiding dysfunction after surgical treatment for LUTs. But as you can see, age over 70 years, uh, a history of diabetes, a history of cerebrovascular accident, and the preoperative uh, adimuscarinic drug uses are possible risk factors. In another paper, there is a table of, uh, um, of papers uh, regarding uh, the factor associated uh, with BPH medication after transurethral prostatectomy. Uh, we can see that the age, more than 70 years of age, history of diabetes and stroke, preoperative use of uh, anticholinergic and beta-3 agonists, as well as diagnostic measure high post-operation IPSS values, high post-operation post-void residual urine, and low post-operation Qmax are critical. In this uh, paper, uh, there, is, uh, 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 there is a study uh, about the success of laser surgery and transurethral resection of the prostate. Uh, we can uh, see that the estimated probability of freedom from uh, medication after three years was 73% for laser patients compared to 78% in TURP patients. There are comparable percentages. And of course, there is an uh, important message from that uh, paper. We need effective patient counseling about the continued or new use of medical therapy. Because in this paper, there is a small group of patients who did not receive medication. They did not wish to receive medication before TURP or laser procedure. And they had to, to receive medication after that procedure. That means uh, that uh, we have to be very careful about uh, patient selection. So the take home message, it's frequent. 20 to 50% of patients have persistent LUTs after TURP. The prevalence of postoperative LUTs are similar for different techniques. 
the bladder remodeling from chronic bladder outlet obstruction contributes to post-operative lutes and the rates of BPH lutes medication used following thresholder prostatectomy are considerable. Unfortunately, in uh, uh, guidelines, there are no recommendations or there are no best practices to inform urologists how to use the medical therapy following BPH surgery. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Athanasius, for uh, clarifying this issue, which is really a problem because the percentage of patients starting uh, medical therapy after surgery is really high. And that is something that we have to, uh, to inform because it is apparently not a, a, a mistake from the urologist. It's not a wrong surgery. It's probably a consequence of a long-standing bladder outlet obstruction. So, uh, Lucas, uh, from you from Poland, uh, would you like to present a case? Uh, so we might uh, discuss uh, these issues all together. Of course, it will be a pleasure, Professor. So, uh, dear chairman, uh, dear colleagues, after the deep theoretical insight into the management of LADS by the respected colleagues, let's confront the good clinical uh, practice with real case scenario. 79-year-old patient uh, uh, who was a journalist uh, came to my office due to severe LADS, especially as for the storage phase is concerned. Uh, additionally, he was uh, complaining uh, uh, of um, a repetitive feeling of incomplete emptying uh, of the bladder. Uh, based on his previous medical chart, it occurred that uh, he had already been treated uh, due to bladder outlet obstruction, um, both pharmacologically and surgically. During the visit, patient admitted also long-term use of tolterodine and um, his current uh, Euroflowmetry was as follows. Qmax uh, 7 milliliters per second, voided volume 124, and finally residual volume was uh, assessed as 80 milliliters. Uh, what is more, no abnormalities were found in the uh, ultrasound of his upper urinary tracts, and his prostate was assessed to be 25 milliliters. Worth mentioning is also uh, uh, that he suffered from uh, serious comorbidities. Uh, I think most important uh, issue is uh, that he uh, continues to live in pain due to traumatic uh, spine fracture that uh, was already uh, treated uh, invasively. Uh, during uh, physical examination, uh, I revealed no abnormalities as for his abdominal cavity and external genitalia and digital rectal examination was uh, normal as well. Uh, as for the additional tests, I performed uh, urine test and urine culture, both were uh, negative. <clears throat> and, uh, I asked also patient to fulfill um, bladder diary, and here you see uh, an example of one uh, day record coming from his uh, mobile application. Professor Cruz, could you kindly comment on the primary diagnosis at this stage? Lucas, uh, well, uh, it is quite clear that uh, he, this patient has persistent LUTs after the surgery, uh, has very severe storage LUTs, probably more than the voiding LUTs. And uh, this is, in my view, in agreement wa uh, with what we see in the bladder diary. The, the voided volumes are relatively small and we have a very high frequency. Uh, if you ask me if it is a detrusor and their activity that uh, uh, it is my primary diagnosis from the, this clinical information, I would say no, because the post vital residual is small. Uh, I don't think he has a neurogenic bladder because he has no other neurological symptoms. And I don't think that the surgery he had might have affected the spinal cord. So really, I think the most probably diagnosis will be OAB slash detrusor overactivity. Of course, thank you. And uh, Professor Agro, 
Uh, would you consider performing at this stage invasive urodynamic testing? In other words, a complete urodynamic study? Uh, yes, I think that this could be an indication. I was uh, replying some questions during uh, uh, the other talks, and one of these questions was about uh, uh, why the guidelines do not recommend clearly uh, to use urodynamics in already operated patients, and this is the case of, of this, this guy. I think that the guidelines state that you have to uh, use urodynamics whenever you want to understand better the pathophysiology of the of the LATS, and I think that uh, a person who had already received a, a surgical procedure for uh, this obstruction is a person where we have to be um, really sure of what uh, the pathophysiology underlying the LATS is. So I think that is already in the guidelines that we should use uh, urodynamics in this case. So briefly, my answer is yes, I would use invasive urodynamics in this person. Of course, thank you very much. And so did I, as we all agreed, I have performed uh, urodynamics in Mr. H, and here's the result of the test. Briefly, you can see fluctuating intermittent flow with pure Qmax uh, and nearly 90 uh, uh, milliliters of uh, residual, while in pressure flow study, uh, the Pacasti reached over 200 meters and uh, overactivity of the detrusor was observed. As for the micturition uh, phase, uh, bladder contractility index uh, reached uh, 120 and bladder obstruction index uh, was equivocal. Uh, finally, residual was 100 milliliters. Unexpectedly, Following urodynamics, patient developed acute and serious complication, which is urinary sepsis. After discharging home from intensive care unit, he was also colonized with alert pathogen. Professor Agro, would you be of the opinion that antibiotic prophylaxis should be administered before urodynamics, and if so, in which setting? Uh, well, uh, I don't think I don't think so. Uh, at least uh, not in uh, let's say not in the general population. This is uh, clearly stated in the in the in our guidelines. So not use uh, uh, antibiotic prophylaxis uh, in uh, in uh, in all patients. And I, this is something I do not do in my my practice. Uh, what we do usually uh, in, uh, in my hospital, uh, we want to have uh, all uh, uh, patients coming with uh, urine, urine, urine analysis and urine culture uh, before, uh, before the test. So we can, uh, uh, I mean, have uh, clues of uh, the presence of, of a pre-existing uh, infection. And of course, in that case, we can treat before the test the that infection, I don't know in this case, but maybe this patient could have a pre-existing infection not acquired after after the test. Um, but I think uh, this is what we actually do. But uh, again, briefly, uh, the, the the answer is no. I don't think that we should do antibiotic prophylaxis in in all patients undergoing urodynamics. Of course, thank you. So. Uh, at this stage, Professor Cruz, would you uh, kindly consider what are the possible options of treatment? Well, uh, uh, clearly, uh, uh, I think the most important symptoms here are uh, the storage symptoms. Uh, uh, the flow is not particularly high, so I would probably, uh, uh, at the beginning, try to use Mirabegron in order to avoid further reduction in the flow and an increase in phosphate residual. It's not very high, it's 100 ml, but well. Uh, and uh, I would be carefully in. Uh, checking uh, if uh, the situation was improving. And if necessary, I would consider uh, to introduce an alpha blocker afterwards. But I my first medication would be Mirabegron 50 milligrams. I couldn't agree more and I did so. So the patient's uh, LATS was uh, well treated accordingly and patient uh, remained satisfied for at least three 
months. Unfortunately, the next follow-up visit reveals significant deterioration of quality of patient's life, and uh, that deterior deterioration was connected with poor urine flow. Professor Zakario, would you opt for the surgery at this stage? We have already tried uh, conservative uh, medical measurements. So uh, uh, before surgery and before uh, surgical intervention, we should uh, check the urethra and uh, the uh, prostate, uh, the residual uh, prostate. Uh, we should uh, have a, a urethroscopy to go on. Of course. So <clears throat> uh, I performed uh, cystoscopy and uh, after just after that, uh, re-TRP, re uh, due to the fact that uh, I observed regrowth of the adenoma uh, with uh, lowered bladder capacity and also significant trapeculation of the bladder. Subsequently, patient uh, was truly relieved as for his LUTs, and I observed minor improvement in the next uh, following uh, three months. Uh, however, mm, patients, uh, especially storage LUTs, uh, needed some additional medication. And uh, at this particular stage, patient responded well to the combination of solifenacin and mirabegron. Professor Cruz, what is your opinion on this specific combination in post-TRP LATS? Well, uh, uh, I'll try to avoid as much as possible combination therapy. And uh, actually, this is one of the questions that uh, was put by one of the attendees. If uh, uh, indeed which the polypharmacy should be still used or not. I would probably start with mirabegron uh, or with tolterodine or with solifenacin, one of the, it, it might depend on the availability in the country uh, and uh, on the reimbursement issues that uh, each drug might have and to see if the response would be uh, okay, satisfying and only after a period of uh, monotherapy, I would go to uh, a combination therapy. Of course, thank you very much. So, um, unfortunately, I was short-sighted uh, to believe that the patient will uh, feel a relief after this particular uh, management. Uh, so, Professor Zakario, would you support the idea to use Botox and also uh, Botox uh, in the office? at this stage. We have already tried uh, first line uh, treatment for overactive bladder. Uh, and uh, as we realized, there is no success uh, in uh, th this way of management. So yes, we could proceed with uh, Botox. Uh, uh, for your second uh, part of your question, about uh, Botox in office uh, urology. Uh, there are uh, European countries that permit uh, the use of uh, Botox uh, in office and some European countries that does not, do not permit. It depends on the healthcare system or financial reimbursement and uh, of course uh, the legal uh, issue that uh, come uh, from uh, Botox uh, use uh, in office. If, if we can, according to our healthcare system, we should proceed. Of course. And I did so. Uh, and to sum up, Botox was uh, what patient truly needed. Uh, but uh, if it wasn't for the lack of uh, reimbursement, because that's the case in Poland, the problem would be uh, solved now. So to conclude, please uh, do not forget about the top possible reason for persistent LATS after surgery, which is the or overactivity. Uh, in OIB patients, uh, simple removal of the obstruction uh, will not be curative in over one third of patients. And finally, informing the patients about the reason of ups and downs of our treatment policy is a strategy for the improvement uh, of patient compliance. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Lucas, for this interesting case that uh, will give us the possibility to discuss uh, different aspects of uh, uh, male LUTs treatment. 
before and after surgery. And uh, uh, I, I'd like to, to hear from you, what is your view about overusing medical treatment and eventually by not investigating correctly bladder outlet obstruction, we are giving the possibility, we are allowing the bladder to deteriorate and then after surgery, the results are not so effective. Yes, uh, well, yes uh, exactly. Lucas, yes, please go ahead. Of course. So uh, if you want uh, to be um, satisfied uh, after the surgery, of course, uh, which is co strongly connected with patient satisfaction, uh, we have to uh, have in mind that uh, uh, aging processes also can be connected, of course, with the bladder and lower urinary tracts. And here's the... Um, best, I think, example of such a uh, process, such a pathological process that we can uh, encounter uh, in our everyday clinical practice. So it's very crucial to not to miss the moment when can we still uh, send refer patient uh, for the for the uh, hospital and to the um, for the uh, specific surgery. Uh, in my opinion, uh, it's very uh, important uh, to have this diagnosis um, determined based on invasive tests in this uh, particular case. Uh, and I'm very, uh, um, I'm, a very I'm a big fan of uh, urodynamic study. Uh, of course, not uh, to be used in all cases, but uh, each particular time I've got a patient with uh, uh, mm, with, with great uh, amount of residual volume, with poor uh, uh, QMAX, and also, uh, especially in elderly patient, uh, I would definitely opt for performing such a, such a test before deciding what to do. Maybe not uh, only for the patient discussion uh, in the office, but also uh, to be ready, to be ready what is going to happen after the procedure. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, uh... Clearly, in this case uh, you presented, uh, the first surgery was not totally successful because at least there was a regrowth of the prostate. Uh, it might be a problem with the previous surgery. It might be a consequence of inflammation that accelerates the process of, uh, of uh, prostate growth. Uh, but... Um, uh, do you think, Enrico, that uh, when uh, the symptoms after a surgery uh, appear uh, very uh, and become very intense, in addition to urodynamics, we should perform a cystoscopy to check the prostate cavity? Because it is not recommended for, for initial male evaluation, but after surgery, what do you think? I think so. I think so. I agree. Uh, and I, I, I would say, that, I mean, in my personal schedule, uh, let's say, uh, if uh, uh, a, a patient was uh, recently operated, let's say three or six months ago, uh, uh, I would go first for a, a cystoscopy, uretrocystoscopy, then urodynamics. I mean, you know that I'm a urodynamic fan, but, uh, but in this case, I think that it's very, very uh, possible that there is a uh, a problem like, like a stretcher or, uh, or, or uh, some kind of uh, post-surgical uh, problem, especially if the patient has experienced the, an improvement just after the, um, the, the, the surgical procedure and then a sudden uh, worsening of, of the situation. So I think in this case, the, the urethrocystoscopy is very important. But uh, uh, in general, uh, to answer your question, I think that yes, in, in combination with urodynamics uh, in this particular patient population urethrocystoscopy is, is important for, to, to give us uh, more information. Uh, uh, well, uh, Athanasius, uh, uh, it's really a problem uh, in the urological community, this uh, uh, number of patients that are under treatment. Uh, do you think that uh, uh, we should uh, uh, stretch this over treat this treatment after prostatectomy uh, uh, with double or triple uh, 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 medication uh, or uh, should we 
probably uh, try to redo the prostatectomy in order to remove the tissue that was left behind. Uh, yes, a very interesting and difficult uh, <laughs> uh, question. Uh, first of all, uh, medication after uh, TURP, uh, A blockers. Uh, there is no blood or neck, uh, uh, there is no prostatic urethra, so there are no uh, uh, exact uh, way of uh, medication of, uh, for alpha blockers. Uh, do they work after prostatectomy? Uh, we believe that there are. Uh, uh, some uh, receptors in uh, blood, so maybe we expect some. Uh, 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 we expect uh, uh, alpha blockers, A blockers, uh, to work from uh, receptors, uh, A receptors in blood. Do they work? We don't know. Uh, five hours. Uh, uh, they work only if uh, there is a residual prostatic uh, tissue. Uh, anti muscarinics and uh, beta 3 agonists, uh, they work on uh, the bladder, but if a uh, uh, bladder war is, uh, uh, has a collagen and uh, has uh, uh, other problems due to uh, obstruction, it's difficult to work on that uh, part. So uh, I think that after a short trial of uh, drugs, we don't, we are not sure about their actual way of uh, working, we should try to see the prostate, the remaining prostate, if there is obstruction. It's uh, one way uh, to, th th there are not multiple ways of uh, thinking. Uh, we don't have prostate, we, we cannot see how uh, drugs work in that uh, way. So we should uh, go on with the stethoscopy and check what is going on back. Uh, we have, uh, and I, I don't know, it's for all of us. Uh, there is one question from one attendee uh, uh, saying that, well, very often after a QRP, uh, patients uh, complain of uh, pain during intuition, some kind of dysuria. It's not exactly a storage symptom, not exactly a voiding symptom, it's just pain. Uh, all you consider to use in first place and during a few weeks uh, uh, an anti-inflammatory agent? Uh, to answer? Uh, to you and to Enrico, for example. Uh, well, uh, we could, uh, we could uh, give some uh, some uh, advice about uh, water consumption, uh, and uh, they, uh, we could uh, give some advice uh, about uh, anti-inflammatory in the beginning. Uh, if uh, there is, uh, we should uh, go on with uh, urine culture to check if uh, there is uh, an infection uh, after uh, the surgery, and then uh, we could uh, go on with uh, anticholinergics or uh, beta three agonists. Uh, as long as there is a right and efficient uh, prostatectomy. Uh, Enrico, do you use the non-inflammatory, uh, the, the non-steroid inflammatory agents uh, 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 for this pain in the first few weeks after QRP? Yes, sometimes I, I, I do it. Uh, I, I think that's not so common actually in my, in my, my practice. We, have seen, uh, 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 of course, I mean, there is a big debate on that, but we have seen uh, some more of these problems uh, after the use of some uh, lasers, for, uh, I mean, for uh, some uh, more, let's say, irritative symptoms after, after, after surgery with, with lasers. This is at least our... our uh, we, we have the same opinion. We, we have uh, okay. the same impression. Yeah, yeah, but I mean, I mean you, you know that some others do not uh, agree with that, but I mean, <laughs> this is our impressions. And, um, uh, but I mean, it's not that common, but in some cases I, I, I do it. But going back to the, 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 the discussion on, on urodynamics, uh, for instance, to 
uh, know before the treatment that the patient has got an important drusover activity can help us to explain him that after surgery, it can be uh, a, a bad period. I mean, it can, the patients may experience even a worsening of the symptoms because the drusover activity, activity can, can get worse and also to remove the prostate that is a little bit something op that uh, put an, an obstacle to the outflow of the urine can even uh, cause uh, an incontinence, a temporary incontinence. Right. So, I mean, in this case, uh, to, to know better the situation can, can help us. Uh, uh, I just wanted to add this, uh, this consideration. Uh, I, I totally agree with you that patients with strong uh, and severe storage symptoms should not be uh, indicated for uh, surgery before a complete uh, urodynamic evaluation. Uh, uh, one final question for Athanasius and for Lucas. Uh, if a patient has uh, nocturia after a TYP, how would you proceed? Uh, uh, okay. Uh, first of all, uh, we, we, we should check uh, the medicine. Uh, some people uh, take medicine in uh, a wrong hour. For example, uh, I have found the patients uh, taking diuretics uh, uh, during nighttime, before bedtime. So we should change uh, medicine and check uh, what the medicine should go on and which medicine should, uh, uh, should uh, stop, uh, which medicine they should stop. Uh, second, uh, we, uh, we give advice about uh, uh, water consumption up to eight uh, o'clock. Do not, uh, they, we advise them not to use uh, uh, water and uh, do not drink uh, alcoholic uh, uh, at uh, late night uh, hours. Uh, uh, we don't, uh, we don't usually desmopressin in uh, all the patients and uh, uh, actually uh, if uh, there is a, a bladder diary we can uh, go with uh, more safety uh, about uh, uh, conservative management uh, with uh, drunk uh, we need a, a bladder diary and uh, a three bladder diary to go on uh, yeah, so I, I'm sorry, I, I, Lucas. I, I saw one of the questions entering uh, uh, and from the from the audience, and I think it is an interesting one. How long would you uh, wait after a TRP? Uh, the patient has persistent uh, symptoms. How long would you wait until performing uh, uh, a cystoscopy and the eventually urodynamic test? So uh, as for the guidelines, of course, we all know that uh, it is a uh, four week time until uh, we meet with the patient again in uh, our office after TRP. And here is the place for uh, Euroflowmetry. As for the other uh, tests, uh, the guidelines uh, uh, don't... Uh, um, Indicate a precise don't time. Define, yeah, yeah, exactly. Don't define the uh, specific uh, timing. Uh, as uh, you've seen in our uh, in my slides, uh, it was usually a three month interval between the visits. Uh, to the best of my knowledge, uh, we can expect uh, urethral stricture uh, to have place in, let's say, three to six months post uh, TRP surgery. So I would, uh, I would wait uh, uh, at least uh, three to six months after the procedure uh, to feel worried uh, that uh, there is something wrong and to proceed with a more invasive uh, tests. Of course, it is uh, also um, specific timing of uh, the drugs to, 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 to be, to be uh, efficient. Uh, and uh, again, all the uh, typical anticholinergics uh, and alpha blockers uh, should be should be uh, uh, assessed after at least four weeks. So uh, I think uh, it's a good uh, policy to uh, remember out about this uh, three month uh, to to six month uh, time um, until uh, uh, de deciding to to uh, to proceed with more invasive uh, both diagnostics and treatment. Well, uh, 
Uh, we are reaching the end of the webinar. And so, uh, first of all, I would like to send to thank all the attendees and uh, to tell them that if there are no replies uh, live during the webinar, we will try to reply afterwards uh, to everyone. Uh, I would like to thank uh, Athanasius, Enrico, and Lucas for your excellent presentations. And uh, to conclude, I think uh, it is important to uh, keep in mind that clinical investigation is useful, still useful to decide the treatment. Uh, in some patients, clinical investigation is not enough and a good quality urodynamic tests, including invasive urodynamics, might be necessary in order to discuss with the patient the ideal treatment. And uh, uh, also, uh, to, we should probably inform many of our patients uh, that uh, uh, the, the lower urinary tract symptoms might persist despite a good uh, TYP uh, done. And so at least they might need to wait uh, a couple of months, like three to six months before another invasive test uh, to decide if some uh, additional surgery should be necessary. So uh, I would like to thank you all. I would like to thank the office uh, for the sub technical support. And I hope uh, we might do another webinar uh, very soon, combining the two sections. Thank you very much uh, for all of you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Good night.